Hi, it's Karen Rand here for a video podcast uh, and also an audio co- podcast. And this is a follow up to the podcast I did last week about uh, black economic empowerment. I, it was past, present, and future. And I just did that one as a podcast. And, you know, one of the things uh, when I get really passionate about a topic, which I am about this because Black Lives Matter, uh, I can just talk. (laughs) And there was a lot of material to cover in that particular uh, podcast. I talked about the history of systemic racism, its origins from this from slavery in America, all the way through what you know on paper was the Emancipation Proclamation, but then was rapidly uh, manipulated by the white power structure because that's all there were. There were there were no voting rights for blacks until the Fourteenth Amendment, and then because of the Jim Crow laws and the Black Codes, there was this. Uh, a restriction on the ability to vote, which of course led to the civil rights movement led by Martin Luther King Jr. and the uh, uh, then you know the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And and part of what I reason why I did that was because I wanted to um, address some of my friends with white privilege and their misunderstanding of this systemic racism because they don't really, they didn't really get it and, and why that is. And, and so a couple of things that I, and so this, I decided I had to do a follow-up. I decided to do it as a video because what I didn't get to in that last one, I talked about sort of the foundation of why we are where we are when it comes to the economic prosperity of the black and brown community. Uh, The, um, And I didn't really dig into what I really care about and what I really wanted to talk about was what is going on now within uh, entrepreneurism for for the black community, finance and funding for the black community, and what with all of the emotion that's out there right now, what the, you know, examples of what the black community is stepping up to do, but also what the white community is doing to try to um, reverse some of the some of the stuff that has happened so far and you know a big term right now is to be anti-racist so it's not enough just to be not racist we have to be anti-racist meaning that we have to take specific action to make sure that there is no crumbs of racism in the policies and they're all over the place let me just tell you so i'm going to bounce around a little bit um if you go back I'm in the show notes will be the link to the to the um prior podcast so you can listen to that and the impact of redlining on our public school systems that has um really well there was a quote that was in uh, there was a paid advertisement in the Atlanta Journal Constitution this past week <clears throat> that uh, was two pages. You know, what we need to do to never come back here again. And there was a, a quote in here that I, that I wanted to read because I thought it was really very appropriate. Here it is. Dr. Martin Luther King said, this is talking about economic inclusion. It should be noted that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was completely frustrated that white liberals supported civil rights, but disappeared when it it was time to talk about African-American economic inclusion. As Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, it's all right to tell a man to lift himself by his bootstraps but it is cruel jest to say to a bootless man that he ought to lift himself by his own bootstraps. And stop using the lack of access to capital as a form of economic genocide. We need to audit the banks and see that black Americans have equal access to capital 
because we know from the red, it, what I covered in the red line, stuff that, that really, really even just two years ago, there were still 150 cities, including Atlanta, that had red line rules in place that limited the investment in what was designated a black community and therefore a poor investment and for black people themselves to be get access to uh, the to get access to capital when it was to buy a business to fix up a home to buy investment property to buy a home and you know when they do because and i mentioned this and I, and I kind of knew it, but I didn't really say it. So there's this, you know, people talk about affirmative action and how it's leveled the playing field. Well, within affirmative action and in 8A designations, that's where there's the set aside for, um, for businesses that are minority owned to get a certain, a certain guaranteed amount of business goes to those kinds of businesses. But in reality, to qualify for 8A and affirmative action, there's, there's many categories to qualify under that besides being an African-American or their Hispanic qualifies, uh, indigenous Indians, which need a lot of help qualify, women qualify, um, uh, Hasidic Jews qualify, um, uh, and so there's, you know, these categories, oh, disabled vets qualify. I gave an example in my, in the last one about a, a disabled vet that you need to maintain. And when you take investors on, you have to maintain your 51% of that minority in order to continue to get that access to that business. So hopefully I'll have some time to cover some of that when I talk about the top 100 businesses uh, as we move through this. I'm going to try to be a little bit better organized today. Um, so anyway, I wanted, so I wanted to really cover that and talk about if you can get access to Byron Allen. He was the founder, chairman and CEO of Allen Media Group Entertainment Studios, AMG, which I believe is in, um, at, in, in Atlanta. It's called thegrio.com, T-H-E-G-R-I-O.com. And this is all of these things that we can do as white folk that will stand side by side with our brothers and sisters of the black and brown community to help them overcome this, the, the, the effect of hundreds of years of systemic racism. And so, um, Okay, I can't, uh, I can't minimize this. I want to get to my links. All right, so. <laughs> okay, so what I want to, I want to share something with you. So, so you, you truly understand the, the effect that this has had. So this is from the Brookings Group. Yep, I'm still recording. This is from the Brookings Group. Uh, and the links will all be brookings.edu, examining the black, the black and white wealth gap. Close examination of wealth in the U.S. finds evidence of staggering racial disparities. At 171,000 is the net worth average of the typical white family, which is nearly 10 times greater than that of a black family of 17,150 in 2016. Get that? Do you understand that? That's huge. And you go like, how could that possibly be? When there seems like there's so much opportunity that anybody, like my quote, pick themselves up by the bootstraps. There's, you know, all this, all, you know, what, 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 what causes that? Why is that? And I didn't get into, redlining is a huge part of it because of the, the, the whole thing of separate but equal that never really was because of redlining. So we're separate, but they were never equal. And I'm gonna get into the, the 
the segregation that happened right after in the late 1870s and on through the 1920s, that there was great wealth that was created within the segregated black communities. But they did, but the, the white supremacists, the KKK, the, the truly racist, that they not, they not only did they not want equality, and I guess so fearful that the black community could, what would they would do if they were actually equal, that they clamped down so hard to terrorize those communities. And I talked about, and it's been in the news a lot lately, lately because of the Tulsa riots, uh, race riots, but there's so many other examples of some of that stuff that has happened um, in, uh, you know, we had, uh, there's Greenwood, right? There's Rosewood, Florida, that was uh, down by Cedar Key. It was a timber uh, area that, you know, sap and a lot of things that were created. It was a whole community. Slocum, Texas was, was built on oil. You had Seneca Village in the middle of, of Central, what's now is Central Park, was a thriving community in 1825 until the racists of New York took it all away and took all of that away from the black community on their imminent domain to create Central Park. You got North Brentwood in Maryland. You got Reeksville in New York. That is now what you know as, as Bedford, Stuyvesant, and Brooklyn. Pre-Civil War, it was the second largest black community of, of Freelanders. You have Mount Bayou in Mississippi. Uh, you had Glen Arden in Maryland, that was a middle class up until uh, around the 1930s, 1940s. Uh, Blackdom in New Mexico was one of the first uh, Western uh, free black communities. Uh, now it's a ghost town. And so there's been, there's just, and, and there's probably even many more because so much of it has never been documented in the history books because we don't like to acknowledge this part of our American history. So when you look at this 10, 10 times gap, the gaps in the wealth between, this is back to what Brookings.edu wrote, gaps in the wealth between black and white households reveal the effects of accumulated inequality and discrimination as well as the differences in power and opportunity that can be traced back to the nation's inception. I talked about this because um, I learned a lot about it in Michelle Obama's Becoming book. The black and white wealth gap reflects a society that has not and does not afford equality of opportunity to all of its citizens. Efforts by black Americans to build wealth can be traced back through American history, but these efforts have been impeded in a host of ways. So here's a summary of kind of what I spent an hour covering on the last show, last time. Beginning with 256 years of chattel slavery, followed by the congressional mismanagement of the Freedom Savings Bank, which left 61,000 depositors with losses of nearly 3 million in 1874. So that is like right around when the, the freedom was supposed to be happening. And remember, the 40 cows, I mean, the 40 acres and a mule never happened because it was one of these backroom deals that in order to get the union and the, the Confederacy to join the union again, they had to say, no, we're not gonna allow you to do that. But guess what? That is where Greenwood, the Black Wall Street started. The, that community got their land and look what they did with it. We had some of the very early movies done there. Go find the, the videos on YouTube on that. I'll have some of them in my, uh, the, uh, in my, in my um, show notes here, but so yeah, the violent massacre disseminating the Tulsa Greenwoods district in 1921, it was a population of 10,000 that um, they 300 were killed and the entire place was leveled and never restored and was a, was buried in the history books up until only about, I think in the 1980s was when, and now, you know, Tulsa is, is doing a lot to regrow that community or make amends, if you will. Um, and then you had the discriminatory policies through the 20th century, including Jim Crow's era of black codes, 
strictly limiting opportunity to many Southerners in the states, the GI Bill that I spoke about. So the New Deal Fair Labor Standards Act, the black community that came back from uh, serving in, as serving our armed forces were not were exempt from the domestic and agricultural service opportunities. They weren't allowed to get those jobs and they weren't allowed to get the GI Bill and get the land and the education that came with that. And of course the redlining. So that wealth has taken from these communities. So if you believe that education and property ownership, home ownership is um, the way that you are able to to create wealth and you're able to share it within your generation after generation, then you, then you have to understand how obvious it is that we could have a 10x wealth gap. So within the last few years, there has been um, a number of, of step up. And fortunately, with one of the things that came out of the protests, and hopefully the protests will continue this momentum, is that there has been a lot of celebrities that have stepped up and they're do donating millions of dollars to the injustice and racial justice and equality and those kind of things. But my focus is on economic empowerment because it's with economic empowerment that you get true freedom. That is the American dream. The American dream is the ability to invent something and take it to market. And I, and I mentioned in my last sh the last show that when I first got started working with angel investors and with entrepreneurs 15, 20 years ago, I thought that um, opportunity and money was green. If you could make money at it, why wouldn't inv investors invest in it? I, I didn't see it. I guess because I was colorblind. I just didn't really see that it would be, there would be this kind of a thing. But now, you know, now that I'm more involved in it, now that I know, I know I've seen it directly happen with, um, with the, with, uh, I've seen it directly happen with uh, uh, women, you know, um, and men judging women and their ability to do things on that basis. And, and I could get it, you know, where it very well could be within the black community as well, but um, that, you know, I get, I mean, obviously it is because when you look at, oh, uh, where's the number I put on here? It's uh, less than, let's see, less than one and a half percent of the, of black entrepreneurs are venture backed. Yeah, according to CB Insights, less than 1% of venture capital funded tech businesses are owned by Black and African Americans. Less than 1%. That, so my call to action at the end of last show was take out, do, do your own 8A set aside, okay? Do your own. If you are an investor, or if you are a family office fund, if you have a philanthropic fund, if you don't know how to be an angel investor, get my book and then take these principles and apply it that way, but diversify your own portfolio. That's my call to action from this. That if you're gonna invest $100,000 in companies this year as an angel investor, then make sure that at least 25% of that is going into black and brown owned companies, black and African-American companies, okay? And if you are a black investor or you are what would be considered a minority investor because you're a woman investor, then help these companies not lose their 51% when they take on private equity capital be a part of the solution. Don't be a part of the problem. Okay, so let's start with education. So back in the um, back in the the first HBCU was that's a historical black college and universities, and of course they started originally because they were um, segregated. Okay. 
So the first one was started in 1837, uh, Shaney U out of Pennsylvania by Richard Humphreys. They got into financial trouble. We've had our own in Atlanta. We had five at one point in time. Um, and uh, I think it was Morris Brown that uh, had to shut down. And I talked about that in the, my last, um, and I might be wrong, but I believe Clark Atlanta is still there, Spellman, Moore, uh, Morehouse. I uh, apologize for not having looked that up before I got on this call on this. But Spellman and Howard are some of the best that are still around. They have very rich programs. There are now over 100 HBCUs since 1837. They have an endowment of the top five, Spellman, Howard, Hampton, Meharry Medical, and Florida A&U have 1.3 billion combined endowment as of last year, or I think 2018, whereas Harvard alone has 30 billion. That's more than 10 times, right? So, you know, MLK Jr. came out of an HBCU, Oprah, Michael Strahan, Thurgood Marshall, Tuskegee Airmen, Tom Joyner, and so many, many, many more of, of people that you know and respect, big leaders, D grew their um, sense of pride and their development because when you look at when it comes to just regular universities, a college all over the place, right? It, it's fairly diverse. You've got 59% of new college entries, this is all colleges, are Asian, white makes up 42%, black make up 37%, Hispanics 36%, but the rate of completion is 20% higher with Asians and whites than with black and Hispanics. And part of that is when you look at where the black and brown community come from, and they come from these, many of them come from these impoverished communities that have been redlined. So their school system, they, they can get in because there's programs that help them get in, but the transition to those, to those schools and the transition is really hard. So there's programs now that um, that are trying to get uh, trying to get more um, this first gen uh, of of company of first gen of students to be able to get all the way through to help them with that transition, help them be prepared for college. So if you're a philanthropic, go do that. Go put in that. If you're philanthropic. Go put money into the HCBUs. Go put money into uh, the College Negro Fund that will help provide scholarships. So when you look back at some of the fakes, so like Lexus, the car company, 5,000 scholarships for HBCUs. Toyota is doing $50,000 per four different HBCUs. Apple, They've put $40 million towards the diversity engine to be able to help HCBUs, HBCUs. The PGA Tour in Tiger Woods gave specific uh, donation to UMass for a college. They have a, they have a golf program. Um, oh, diversity engineers. That's what uh, Apple's is to, for students going into engineering, black students going into engineering. Kevin Hart uh, gave... Uh, millions of dollars to the uh, the marching um, crew at Texas uh, Texas South Texas Southern University. I'm sorry, I, I I scribbled this stuff down and I can't read my own writing. Obama uh, Foundation, 25 million dollars in grants for cybersecurity education for African American students. The NFL has just recently donated 250 million commitment to systemic racism, which hopefully will help with these inner cities and get their schools up. Because as long as our inner city schools are, and, and even in rural areas, I mean, Oklahoma, Midwest with redlining a lot of that. And, and I, I realize it now because Oklahoma had, where the Tulsa thing had a many, many segregated black communities, which all got impoverished in the 1940s because of the New Deal and redlining. And so, you know, you can look in those areas and you can see where they may not be black communities anymore, but because they were redlined, 
you know, they're, they, there's just poor schools because they don't have the property taxes to fund good schools in those areas. So if education is your thing, find an organization that is helping with the inner city schools. Color of Change, a lot of the celebrities have been giving money to this organization called Color of Change because they are an activist organization that identifies where there's organizations that are not doing enough with diversity or organizations that can help to uplift business communities. So for example, they have worked with DoorDash to promote black and Latino owned businesses that are in the food business in the community. So they, they promote those first. So you can spend your dollars there because you may not know that this restaurant that you want to buy from is black or owned. It may be franchised, but it's still black or brown owned, right? Um, Zoom has uh, done their first, they hired a diversity uh, director, director of diversity um, as a result of color change. GoFundMe, they got GoFundMe to stop the fundraising campaign for Arbery's Killers. There was a fundraising campaign for the defense of Arbery's Killers, and, and they went and they got GoFundMe to stop that. They got Twitter to stop all the misinformation that was going out about the African-American community being immune. Because if you notice, in the early days of COVID, we had a huge, and we still have a very uh, uh, the majority of, of the infections were happening within the, the African-American community. And there was this misinformation out there that they were immune, that it was a white man's disease. Well, that was being, being done probably by the uh, neo-Nazis out there within, the, within Twitter that know how to use this Twitter thing and social media. Uh, they've been working to get shows off the air that are uh, promoting uh, uh, the cop brutality uh they've gotten they they pushed for that for these shows to get taken off and one of the things i learned when i went to their website that i didn't know that half of the black owned businesses out there had never received any of the coronavirus relief fund they never received it why is that well, it goes back to the racist policies of banks not to loan to those businesses. And so they bootstrap themselves to get their business, but they can't get working capital loans. They don't have a banking relationship with Bank America, right? Wells Fargo has come out with a very proactive program supporting the black community. Hopefully it's not just in name only, uh, but there's uh, black owned businesses um, but that's part of the reason why, because the way with the Republicans ran that program, because they were in charge of it, we've seen all kinds of reports about it. The, I shouldn't say that. The Senate, the way it was set up, they just, they, they let it get handled by the big banks without looking at the systemic racism that was in it. I know a lot of people, a lot of people's eyes are being opened that this is going on. So I don't want to blame the Republican led Senate that they intentionally did that because they could be naive like I was for many years, you know, just assume that this wasn't happening. I, would, I had heard of Redline probably seven years ago, but I assumed that it still didn't exist until I was getting involved in Opportunity Zone funds. You wanna get involved in developing inner city areas and helping the entrepreneurs there that could be black owned entrepreneurs, get a, get a hand up and not a handout and get the schools to be enriched, then, invest in an Opportunity Zone Fund that has that as their mission. Michael Jordan has donated $100 million out of his brand over 10 years to be, be specifically to these issues. All right, <clears throat> so let's talk about where to go with, with on, on my side of things, on, on innovation and, and whatnot. So, the Founders Institute has a link. It's the link it, real quickly is really easy if you want to get to it. And it's just a very not, they, they admit that there's probably more than this and they encourage people. If you don't see something you know about on the list, then go and, and comment and get it added to it. But bit.ly bit.ly slash black 
underscore canvas. And it is um, groups of accelerators, incubators, funding sources, angel investor groups, all kinds of groups that are, um, that are helping black entrepreneurs get involved and, um, or, or get what they need. Because you have to understand there's a psychological you know, effect that if you have been, um, as a community, told that you're not worthy, that you're not smart, that you're gonna end up in jail, that you deal with, with this fear because of, of the broken, broken windows policies and the, the drug war, war on drug policies that were started in the Nixon administration, reinforced in the Reagan administration, uh, uh, really embraced in some municipalities. And so somebody for a misdemeanor uh, will you know, go to jail, they lose their college scholarship, uh, they get, they, they, you know, some, they lose their, um, they might be an athlete because I've been the way to get out of it. They want to go to college, but then they lose that because of a, of a, of an infraction and they get into this spiral. Even, um, uh, just recently, you know, you, you, the stories of some of the, these, um, black men that have been murdered, um, that we've been protesting about when they look back and they point, oh, look at all these bad things that they did. And you look back and you say they were actually all really minor things that got compounded and they got into this loop because of probation, that you can't get a good job and you can't get this. And when you have such a high amount of, of blacks in our prisons as a result of these minor infractions that it, with better attorney, with more equal justice, they might not have gone to prison. They might have gotten a first offender's release. Uh, you know, there, there's this, this compounding effect. So within your community, you have this thing where you just don't believe that you are, you can go get money. You don't believe that there's an opportunity. You don't believe naively like I did that money is green. It's not black or white, it's green. And if I can make money, um, if I can make money, then my investors will make money. And so why don't you just believe in that I can make money? So it's really important to understand that we're bringing, we're kind of digging ourselves out of that with things like um, Black Girls Code, which is really, and a lot of emphasis on, st on STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Uh, there's special programs to teach teenagers how to do this, black teens to be able to how to do this and have confidence in their ability to do math and be a part of that. Uh, there's um, just look like what Apple did with, with focusing on engineering. Uh, so, you know, Black Girls Code, they worked out with Lyft that if you round up on Lyft, then that money will go to Black Girls Code. So if you're not really sure you want to be an angel investor and you just want the tax write-off, then go donate to those kind of organizations. All of these organizations operate in a quasi, they might have a sidebar where they invest, but almost all of them are nonprofits that are trying to do this lift up. And so you work on that. Um, so there are organizations that are trying to help first generation college kids uh, from the black community to be able to be successful in college. There's M Magic, I M Magic, I M A G I C dot com, clasp dot org, first generation foundation. So those are all really great things where you can be a um, compassionate capitalist where that's just on the donation side. But if you want to make money by helping entrepreneur, black entrepreneurs succeed then I really recommend that you um, get involved in, in some of these incubators that are listed on the Founders Institute. So, or get involved in some of these organizations. Diversify your portfolio. Make sure you go to a black pitch competition. There's like, and now in this day and age, there's going to be, almost all of them are going to be online for the next bit of while. You don't even have to travel. You can go watch some of these organizations, some of these, these entrepreneurs, pitch their ideas. 
um, you know, when you look at the idea stage, it's just really quite amazing. You got Atlanta, Black Tech, there's uh, Black Female Founders, there's uh, Black Tech Women in the Startup Media, there's um, Chicago Blacks in Technology, Cincinnati Blacks in Technology, I Am Black in Tech, you know, Knox Street Studios. Uh, there's, you know, there's, there's just, there's a, I was really quite encouraged by the number of organizations that are out there trying to help with this. And you get into the, the launch community, um, you've got uh, various different organizations that are the Minority Business Accelerator. Uh, you know, they've got Y Combinator and Techstars listed in here. You know, I'm not, I, I assume they're listed here. They qualify that they've got some specific program for minorities. Uh, you know, so you've got uh, Black Girl Ventures, which is is backed by Kauffman Foundation, Google Code, the Google Cloud Fund for startups, HubSpot, Education to Go. So Black Girl Ventures. There's Pitch Black, which is an organization for BlackAndBrownFounders.com, and they've got online pitch group pitches that they're doing. Uh, Portland, Oregon, for example, in your own community, come together. Portland, Oregon uh, has um, put $3 million into a, an inclusive startup because they were, they, they got the reputation to be the widest city in America. I don't know, but so they wanted to change that. Uh, on, uh, on the uh, Black Enterprise magazine, you got 100 top businesses. What's interesting in there, they do this every year. I only saw one that was a tech company, Rocket Lawyer, if you're familiar with that. Uh, they provide uh, virtual legal services. Uh, they, and they, they were in there, and I, and I was really surprised. Most of the companies, there were a number of construction companies. So my call out to people in the construction industry, get involved with these Opportunity Zone funds. Build these incubators. One of the things that I talked about in the last segment was why is it that all these accelerators and incubators were around Georgia Tech and there were none over by the HBCUs? Why was that? I was part of a Obama think tank group trying to figure out why there wasn't that kind of development over there. OHUB, Rodney Sampson is doing some great work over there. Partner up with him. I mean, we've got C.D. Moody, H.G. Russell, and Benton George in Georgia that are multi, multi-million dollar uh, construction companies that are black owned that could be working in Opportunity Zone funds to solve that problem and work on that. And so there's a, a thing coming up in November, Afrotech, which is going to be a pitch event. So I want to really, that, that's my call to action for you. Be a compassionate capitalist. It's not just about making money. It's not just about owning a business that's a multi-million dollar construction company. It's about taking some of your profits, taking some of the money out of your back pocket and put it to work in these organizations that are doing such great work to, to uplift the, the young and old black entrepreneurs in our country so that they are not just one less than 1% of the venture funds that are out there. Why not be 20, 30, 40% of the venture funds that are out there? There's no reason. And as an angel group, you know, step up and say, we are going to, if, we, if, if my angel group does um, eight investments this year, at least two of them, and you might have to work harder to find you might have to work harder to find the ones that make the same criteria as your other because they don't know to apply to you. And it's not to say the, the black community that I know, they don't want you just to give them the money because they're black. They want to earn it. They want to, I watched a video the other day and, um, oh, it was uh, somebody being interviewed on uh, uh, Trevor Noah's show this lady that's this activist, and I wish I had her name, 
And she was talking about it. And I said, it's so true. She says, you know, the, the, the black community that was taken from their homes in Africa to, be, to become, they were royalty. And they, 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 they birthed our, our world, right, out of Africa. And they came, were brought to the United States against their will. They built this country. Uh, and they, they have shown again and again the ability to master free enterprise, to be very profitable and, and, and responsible with their money. When, well, I was working with the Atlanta Urban League to see what we needed to do to develop uh, black angel groups. One of the things that I learned was sometimes uh, black families come together, the ones that have generated some wealth. And so that might be why you don't necessarily see some of this on the books, but they would pool their funds and they would have the next younger generation pitch a business to them and they would invest in that. And if you know people that do that, well, introduce them to the angel groups or the venture capital funds around you that say, when those businesses get to that point and they need to go to this next level, we want to be the next round of financing for them. Um, one of the best things about crowdfunding is that you often don't know. Women, I knew women do well. I'm going to go look up and see whether the, the black companies that are on crowdfunding do well. But women raise significantly more capital through crowdfunding portals um, compared to otherwise. And part of the reason why is that they're good storytellers. And part of the reason why is guess what? It ain't green. It's not just about the green. When, when you get a chance to tell your story, which is one of the reasons why when I, my, before the recession, my angel investor group was so successful was because I gave an opportunity for companies to tell their story. And the story was what would compel one investor that may not invest in that sector. They may only, only do software, but then they decide they're gonna do this home health solution because of the story that that person told. And so crowdfunding, you, you, in order to be successful in crowdfunding platforms, you have to tell a story. And, and that very well could be that there's a number of of black enterprises that are figuring out that that's a platform because guess what? You're not standing up there being uh, a racial bias deciding that you're not the company that can make millions of dollars or give me 400% RRI on my IRR on my investment. So I just want to say that um, Please go look at the links on my show notes. Please go and get my book if you're not currently an angel investor or investing in companies. Although I don't focus on crowdfunding within this book, it's more for a little bit later stage companies. You can find those late stage companies. When I go out and I speak about economic development, I will be bringing into it now a very specific element of it that looks at the, the local black community and what can local investors do that because a big part of what I talk about in my book is how you can take your your big fat 401k you're an employee of a or you're an executive in a company that's been making hundreds of thousands of dollars and you've got a million dollar 401k a eight hundred thousand dollar 401k go carve out two hundred thousand of that put it in a self-directed IRA and start investing in businesses and make a commitment to have a certain amount of that and, and it doesn't happen half the day. You, it can still make your criteria, but you're not going to invest a certain amount of that money until you find a qualified black enterprise that you believe you can make money with. And you have, that's the capitalist side. And the compassion says, I believe in that entrepreneur. I believe in the passion of that entrepreneur. I believe in the, um, what they're going to do, the innovation that they're bringing to the market. And you're going to invest in them if they're one of those early stage companies. If they're a later stage company that you want to, um, that you want to back and see grow, you know, uh, uh, franchises are a great opportunity. Somebody invents a new franchise and I had one listed. Oh, one of the ones that is on the black, top black 400, the top 100 was, um, oh, 
let's see. It was uh, a franchise. They, they're the largest, uh, second largest black owned McDonald's franchise. And it was, um, oh dear, I'm sorry. Paris Restaurants, Paris Restaurants LTD. So, you know, they, th that now of course they didn't invent McDonald's, but that's an example of, you know, where you can get involved with, a, there's a restaurant that you go to that's a new concept and you say, oh, wow, I didn't realize this, this guy, you know, say it's barbecue, I don't know. I mean, there's all kinds of things. It could be a, a new type of um, lawn care franchise. It could be a new type of uh, professional services or uh, just, you know, um, temp hiring all kinds of, of businesses that might be black owned that have had a successful business. They might be hundreds of thousands of dollars in revenue and they want to grow into another community. They want to open up another location. They want to um, franchise it. Well, you can go in under an interest state investment where investors in that state invest in businesses in that state and they can raise up to $5 million from accredited and unaccredited. So you don't even have to be an accredited investor to do this. If you're just, if you're somebody, if you're a millennial that says, you know, I, I'm very passionate about this. I want to get involved and I want to help a black company that's crowdfunding. Well, then go find that company. You can do that. You can take $2,000 and put it to work in a crowdfunding based company. You can put, uh, $10,000 into somebody that's raising money within their state to expand within their state and go from 10 employees to 100 employees and be that kind of a company. You could do this through a reggae plus kind of, a, of an offering. If a company is three or four million, this is where I focus is with companies that are, are three to eight million in revenue and they, they got a small bit of funding and they need to go to that next round and they need to raise five or 10 million. They can't get it from VCs. They can't get it from another angel group. They can't get it from the banks, but they could be a $50 million company if they got this money to bring manufacturing in from offshore, to be able to launch another product line, to be able to expand in another market. Well, there's ways to grow your brand you advertise and market your brand and your products and what you're doing and you create this buzz and you draw the investors in and under, and under a Reg A plus, you go to Micro Ventures and find some of those. Under a Reg A plus, anybody can participate in those, accredited and unaccredited. I mean, that, it's a great wealth creator. And so if you've got that kind of liquidity or you've got money that you have set aside because you're investing in real estate through a, a self-directed IRA, well, take some of that money and put it to work within um, the black and brown community to help these businesses, help these entrepreneurs. And you know, you don't do it with just one and you don't do it, you have to have a criteria. It can't be emotional because odds are you'll lose your money if you invest based on emotion. But that's what's covered in my book. You can go get it at karenrands.co. And with that, I hope you felt my passion about this. I hope that if you want to contact me, please do karenrands.co, go to my contact page, sign up for my tips on how to succeed as an entrepreneur and an investor. I call it the Compassionate Capitalist Coffee Break and join the Compassionate Capitalist Movement. And uh, when you listen here at the end of this, if you're listening to it on the podcast, you'll hear my sponsors. I have a business plan tool. I have a relationship with a lending organization that lends all type of, uh, of money. Uh, I have an organization that provides advertising um, uh, programs at a discount that I use as part of the growth for growing a brand of a company. Uh, and I have my launch funding network that is a network of all different types of investors. And one of the things that it's gonna be on my to-do list, added to my to-do list is to start calling some of these groups and say, what's your commitment to the, the black community? And I'm going to build my own list and I'm going to say, how much are they setting aside or how much, what is their stated commitment and, and what is the minority participation in their particular organization? And so with that, I want to say thank you for listening. Uh, and uh, 
onwards and upwards. Share this show, please. <laughs>